Good morning to those in the United States and good afternoon to those joining us from Europe. My name is Tony Silberfeld and I'm the Director of Transatlantic Relations at the Bertelsmann Foundation in Washington, D.C. On behalf of the Foundation and colleagues at our parent organization, the Bertelsmann Stiftung in Germany, I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, Goals, Bears, and Brexit, Perspectives from Europe and the United States. So without further ado, let's get into the substance of this discussion. As you know, on June 23rd, voters in the United Kingdom will decide whether they want to remain in the European Union or to leave. According to the Economist Brexit poll tracker, uh, the Leave camp holds a slight advantage with 44% to 42% for remain, with about 10% still undecided. The broad economic consequences of a Brexit have been well documented in numerous studies, including those produced by the Bertelsmann Stiftung, but today we're going to focus on the potential impact on the financial services sector on both sides of the Atlantic. As recently as this week, Jonathan Hill, the EU Commissioner for Financial Services, summed up his views by saying, quote, I think it's bad for the development of the single market in financial services. I think it's bad for the European economy. I think it's bad for financial stability, unquote. But not everyone agrees. Here today to explore these issues over the next 30 minutes will be Alan Homan, Managing Director and Head of Cities Government Affairs Team for Europe, the Middle East, and Africa, and Sunny Kapoor, Managing Director at Redefine, where he advises multilateral organizations, large investors, central banks, and European and emerging governments on economic and financial policy. But first, I'd like to turn the floor over to my colleague, Christian Bluth, from the Global Economic Dynamics Program at the Bertelsmann Stiftung, who will set the scene for our guest speakers. Christian, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Tony. Um, the idea is that I will just briefly introduce into this webinar by giving you a brief description of the financial sector in Britain and why it is so important for the British economy. And I'll say a couple of words on the uh, expected macroeco macroeconomic effect of a potential Brexit. Um, first of all, Britain has a particularly large uh, financial sector. As you can see in this graph, um, which is taken from a Bank of England report, um, it is much larger in comparison um, than, for example, the United States or France or most other major European economies. Uh, the financial sector in Britain employs about 2.2 million people and it contributes uh, the equivalent of 66 billion pounds uh, in taxes to the UK budget. It's also important to look at the composition of uh, the financial sector in Britain. Um, as you can see on the left hand side where you see the actual banking sector, um, the largest share are major UK international banks and you also have a substantial um, share that is uh, represented by investment banks from the rest of the world. Uh, the major and smaller UK domestic uh, banks are only a very tiny fraction of the financial sector in Britain. On the right hand side you have non-bank financial institutions such as pension funds, insurance companies, hedge funds, um, which will also be impacted by a potential Brexit. So let me say a little bit more about um, the ways a potential Brexit might actually impact the financial sector. Of course, the most direct effect is the uncertainty which we already experience presently uh, running up to the referendum. Should there be a vote in favor of a Brexit, that uncertainty is going to amplify um, because the precise terms of the Brexit will not be known. Um, another very direct effect once a Brexit happens is that non-tariff barriers to financial services trade are going to increase. This is because right now most of the British financial sector regulation originates in EU legislation. That means that uh, the U, um, UK banks enjoy what is known as passporting, that is being able to trade in financial services with any other European country without any further regulatory interference. If Britain is no longer part of the EU, um, this regulation would have to be replaced with uh, UK national regulations 
and that means that uh, they won't automatically be able to trade in financial services with uh, other European countries. They would have to go through a process of having their regulation recognized as equivalent, which will in fact constitute a non-tariff barrier to trade. Also derivative trading will be impacted because presently most EU courts um, recognize UK law, which is mostly governing um, uh, derivative trading. This is not likely to continue in the case of Brexit. So um, that will have an effect on the uh, amount of derivative trading going on in London. And of course you have the indirect effect of a reduced general economic activity that will come from a Brexit, um, which is going to lead to a vicious circle. Um, since the economy is growing slower, it will require less financial services. The financial sector will shrink, which will then again impact the gross prospects of the economy. And the same is true for the reduced general trade with the EU. Um, we at the Bertelsmann Stiftung have uh, done a study on the potential effects of um, a Brexit on a variety of sectors, which you see in this graph. And as you can see that the financial sector, which is circled in light blue, is particularly badly affected by a Brexit under all scenarios. Um, you also have a negative effect, as you see in this graph, for example, for chemicals, but this is only in, in sort of the worst case scenario, which is uh, highlighted by the reds and by the orange in the graph. But for sort of lighter exit scenarios, which would include a free trade area with the uh, EU, um, there the effects are not as bad. For the financial sector, under any scenario, the effects are among the worst and the impact is going to be considerable. This assessment is shared um, by people who work in the financial sector in Britain. Um, we have done this survey earlier this year and as you can see, negative opinions as being represented by the red bars uh, are very prominent and few people expect positive effects. Uh, in these columns, the, 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 the center to the left ones, I don't know whether you can see my mouse, you see the effects on the finance industry, on revenue, on investment levels and employment levels, and uh, no surprise, the expectation is that it's quite negative. Um, given these effects, I think it's much more interesting now to hear from our guests who can sort of paint a much more accurate picture and a much more detailed one because unlike me they don't know only these aggregate figures but they can also tell you what is going on in the financial sector right now. Thank you very much. Thank you Christian. Uh, as I alluded to at the top of the discussion, um, the consequences of a Brexit will not just be confined to London and European capitals uh, but will likely touch Wall Street and international companies with operations in the UK and Europe as well. Uh, here to give a perspective from an American company with operations in London, throughout Europe, and indeed around the world, uh, is Alan Homan from Citi. Alan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Tony. Um, so just to um, reiterate what Christian said, we completely agree with that analysis. Um, you didn't quite steal my thunder, but I'll go into maybe a little bit more detail. But we think those are precisely the effects um, that we would see. I mean, Citi is making marking this as one of the major geopolitical events of this year. Um, so we're not taking this lightly. Um, we've put the possibility or the likelihood of this happening at between 30 and 40 percent. Um, we recently revised it up to the top end of that range, so near 40 percent, which is pretty much near the, where the betting markets are looking at. Um, and it is, if you're looking at the polls, um, the margin of error in the polling suggests that leave is almost as likely as remain. So um, this is not a tail risk. Uh, sorry, it's not a base case, but it's certainly not a tail risk um, in, in terms of um, our planning. Um, the, the reason we're, we're in London, of all the European um, destinations, um, is the, the value of London as a financial center. Um, we always think of London in three ways. It's a global center, it's a European center, and it's a domestic center for finance. Um, City um, positions itself very much the first two, the global and the European. Um, we do all of our European business.
business in our broker dealer out of the London um, legal vehicle. Um, so from, from that from that perspective, you can see that the investment that has gone into the, the our European um, banking operations has, um, for many many years, been centred on the UK. Um, so when Christian talks about the passporting, that's precisely what exercises all of us. The passport is, in terms of European legislation, is the right to do business with anyone, anywhere, from anywhere, inside the European Union. Um, and our broker dealer is in London for that reason, as indeed um, are the other US banks. It's it's no surprise, perhaps, that the US financial services industry has been one of the most vocal um, in the campaign and, in the, and leading up to this um, event, and a number of banks have actually given financial contributions to the Remain campaign. Um, that is because it affects US banks probably more than most. Um, so where does this take us? If the passport um, ceases to apply, and we don't know precisely when that would be, but if the UK votes to leave, there's a period of negotiation um, to exit the EU. Thereafter, the, 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 the MIFID passport, the CRD passport, and all the other passports, um, the AIFMD passport, uh, would cease to apply. This puts um, major international firms in something of a quandary. Do we wait and see what can be negotiated in the second half of the negotiating process? Don't forget the so-called Article 50 a resignation letter is largely about leaving the EU, the exit. It's not really about the future trade relations uh, between the UK and the EU. Many, many people and commentators say, rather than these happening in parallel, the exit would happen first and the future agreement would happen second. Without the certainty and the timeline of when that second part of negotiation would take place, e.g. will there be a transition into a new passporting regime, a lot of firms would have to take the decision of whether or not to um, build a second subsidiary inside the rest of the remaining European Union. Um, and that is basically where the question boils down to. To maintain access to clients, do you, in fact, build a continental European uh, legal vehicle to, to maintain business? I, I'd probably stop there because those, those are the highlights of what we're, we're saying, but I'll leave the rest for questions. That's great, Alan. Thank you very much. Um, with that, I want to turn over to Sunny Kapoor uh, for our European perspective. Sunny? Thank you. Uh, I think a lot of the sort of negative scenario uh, that is most likely to happen from the perspective of the UK has already been discussed. I cannot but fully agree with that and maybe even go a step further. Um, it is important to remember that there is nothing in particular about the UK that keeps the financial system and financial service industry here. Uh, time zone is often mentioned, but Paris and Frankfurt and uh, Dublin are more or less in the same time zone or in exactly the same time zone. Uh, there's a lot of discussion of uh, skilled professionals and critical mass. Uh, it's the 21st century. A lot of Brits work in New York. A lot of New Yorkers work in the UK. Um, the most skilled professionals can and will easily move. Uh, it is often mentioned as a stable regulatory regime. Well, that we will um, see the exact unwinding of, as was mentioned by the gentleman from City. Um, and then there is the burden of history or you know, the historical path that this is somehow we accidentally arrived here. Uh, well, history changes, uh, things change, and for example, if the European Central Bank had actually won the case uh, in the European Court of Justice against the UK about whether or not it should be allowed to clear euro-based transactions in the UK, which is outside the eurozone, or whether they had to be relocated within the eurozone. Uh, a lot of settlement business, etc., would already have shifted uh, to the uh, continental eurozone. Uh, and that is just a tiny hit of the protection that has been awarded to the UK's financial system by being part of the European Union. 
it has meant that a very substantial proportion of financial activity that is actually related to investment to the continent and from the continent uh, has more or less been allowed to pass through the United Kingdom and the City of London in particular, uh, much to our advantage uh, with us in the UK having been allowed to create fairly high paying jobs, capture a lot of the taxation benefits, as well as have ancillary benefits that flow from having high value added uh, services in our country. And there will be absolutely no incentive for anybody in the Eurozone to allow that to continue if particularly we exit in the manner which we are likely to, which is by thumbing our nose, having acted as spoiled kids with the rest of the European Union. Uh, so it is very likely that the legal repercussions uh, are going to be swift and the amount of goodwill that would be necessary to have a gradual transition or to have continuity which might allow the city to maintain its preeminence, that goodwill would be seriously lacking. And if for a minute I took off my hat as a British citizen and looked at uh, how things would look like if I were French or German, my God, I would be annoyed. Uh, so there will be very little political space left in order to get any kind of attractive deal. Uh, the deal that is most likely to keep the passporting arrangements that were spoken about by both speakers, which are very critical, uh, would be to continue to be part of the European economic area um, and have maybe perhaps a Norway-like arrangement. That deal would be completely unacceptable to those who are actually pushing for a Brexit because like Norway then, the UK will more or less continue to pay a fairly substantial amount into the EU budget. In fact, Norway only pays a little bit less. Uh, like Norway, the UK will have to accept more or less all single market regulations. So the idea behind Brexiters who are pushing for more sovereignty, that would be lost. Those pushing for a reduction in our payments to the European Union, that would be lost. And most importantly, a very substantial part of the pro-Brexit debate is being driven by those who are anti-immigration. And as we know from both Norway and Switzerland, free movement of people is likely to be part of any such deal. And that potentially even joining Schengen would be totally unacceptable to those who win the referendum if we leave the UK, uh, if we leave the EU. So in any realistic scenario that one can look at, the legal regime, the regulatory regime, the passporting regime will change fairly drastically and the writing will be on the wall so that there will be a significant relocation of financial services, both the legal regimes, uh, people, jobs, as well as ancillary activity to various other centers uh, within the EU as well as to Anglophone uh, Dublin as well as Anglophone New York outside the EU. Uh, it's a very depressing scenario and the last point I would like to make is uh, in addition to the negative impacts from status quo, the biggest shame would be the huge opportunity cost that the UK will inflict on itself in financial services because it is only now that the capital markets union is being promoted and the European Commission appears to be serious about the project. It is only now that one is starting to look at the potential for intermediation and huge new capacity and jobs to be created for intermediating uh, savings from the continent as well as from the UK in pension funds, large insurance firms which are earning very poor returns because of home bias and investments primarily in OECD countries towards emerging market opportunities. In the UK one must remind oneself has got a lot of substantial expertise on emerging market investment and it was perfectly suited to have captured the job growth, the growth in the size of the industry as well as additional benefits of export revenue and taxation uh, that would have come from these massive growth sectors. Uh, so all in all a very depressing scenario for financial services from the UK 
um, from the perspective of the continent and other financial centers, perhaps long-term potential gain, but after a very substantial short-term shock for everybody involved. Thank you, Sonny, for those remarks. Uh, both of our speakers have given us plenty of avenues to explore further. So we're now going to shift our attention in the remaining 10 or 12 minutes that we have uh, to questions submitted during today's presentation. Uh, as a reminder, you can still submit questions through, through the questions pane in your attendee control panel. Uh, we seem to be getting a lot of interest around one particular uh, issue, and that is what plan B would be in the event of a Brexit. Um, where would banks decide to relocate, and I wonder, Alan, maybe starting with you, if you could give your assessment of alternative locations and, and what, what the capacity is in those locations to fill the void that might be left by London. Uh, thank you. Um, well, this is the question we're all asking ourselves. Um, no market um, in the EU comes close to the diversity and the one-stop shop that London has, so all other markets are potentially subscale and suboptimal as um, plan as, as you say plan B um, there are different advantages in different places Frankfurt is close to the ECB uh, Luxembourg has its asset management industry Ireland has a very large um, back office and, and um, insurance sector uh, but nothing nothing quite um, substitutes for London um, one of the one of the big fears I think is that no one benefits and a lot of the business goes outside the EU altogether. It um, is re relocated for all sorts of reasons, um, not least labor laws and um, other advantages um, in other countries that are not European Union countries. Um, so th there could be a net loss, net net loss to the whole of the EU, including the UK. Alan, just to follow up on that, are, are there particular regions outside of Europe then that would be more attractive than others? In the, in the event of a Brexit? Um, that, it, it, lots of places have their advantages, as I say. A lot of people might um, go home to New York. Some might think that the Gulf states have, uh, Dubai has a lot to offer, Singapore is up and coming. Um, so the, the, the where next, the plan B, I think is, um, is what most banks are actively thinking about just now. Thank you for that. Um, another area of interest seems to be touching on a point that Sonny made earlier uh, with regard to the lack of goodwill uh, that might exist between, uh, well, former member states, I suppose, and member states. Um, and I wanted to see, Sonny, if you could speak to uh, what the aftermath is likely to be around a Brexit, whether you know, we talk about this two-year transition period and what is likely to be negotiated during that time. Um, but do you think that the, the EU, because of the result of a referendum, if it, if it happens to be a Brexit, if the EU will seek to punish the UK in order to dissuade others from following suit? Um, there's a good answer and a bad answer. Um, the I think the bad and the more realistic answer is that from a mere political economic perspective, the sensible thing, the logical thing for the rest of the EU to do would actually be to make sure that the UK pays a price. It's not quite cutting off your nose to spite your face uh, because the negative impact of an exit on the rest of the EU will be far smaller than the negative impact on the UK. So there's an asymmetry there which is important. And the second is were the EU, were the rest of the EU not to do that there is a very real danger, given the rise of gate builders in the Netherlands, Marine Le Pen in France, and similar populist anti-Euro, and actually nowadays increasingly even anti-EU, uh, anti-establishment parties, that there would at the very least be a call for similar referendums, people, citizens wanting to be given voices, um, and if not, there would be political disruption at the very least, as more of these anti-Euro, anti-EU parties make it into the parliament and sometimes into governments. Uh, so I think the most likely scenario would be to make sure that the UK uh, suffers economically, is cast out and loses influence, whether or not it's the honorable thing to do or not. But uh, in real politics, I think that is most likely. Thank you, Sonny. Uh, 
And Alan, just if I could come back to you uh, on an issue here. You know, I know I realize we're talking hypotheticals at this point, but as we look to the, this two-year transition period, or however long it'll ultimately be for renegotiation, everyone's mentioned passporting as being a, a, a top priority. Are there other issues that will be on the agenda for, for city and for other in the banking industry uh, that you can see during that negotiating period? Um, our, our analysis here is that the two-year negotiating period is for the exit, not for the future relationship. I think there's a sort of slight confusion of quite what the European Union will want to be doing in this period. I mean, it's very clear that the 27 remaining countries um, agree their objectives for this um, negotiation and mandate the European Commission to deal with the UK to close down the relationship. Uh, quite what they then negotiate um, for the future relationship um, is, of course, further away uh, in in time. And um, the, the the we have yet to ascertain from the Leave campaign precisely what aspirations they would have um, for those future negotiations. Um, we may be lucky, and these can all be conflated and run in parallel. But I suspect, given the resource constraints. Uh, they won't be. They'll, run, they'll be run sequentially, um, and that this puts us into a very uh, difficult position: volatility and uncertainty. While we wait to find out what the objectives are for for um, um, the, the, the future relationship, I think passporting would be number one. Of course, we're all very concerned about our staff, um, who not are not just Europeans. Of course, they're from all over the world, but you know, it's a, it's a, London is a very global place. And a very, very large percentage of the staff are from continental Europe. Um, so we staff rights to remain in London and to keep working for the for the bank, of course, are, are high on our list of of um, requirements. Um, and then, of course, we're looking at Scotland and Northern Ireland. Um, City has a very large um, presence in Belfast, in Northern Ireland, and a lot of commentators point to um, a, Sc a second Scottish referendum and potentially disruption in Northern Ireland um, if uh, there's a vote to leave. So the, 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 this, this thing doesn't have uh, one set of consequences. They, they ripple out in all directions. Um, and of course, uh, large firms have to take account of all of these things. I mean, I should make very clear, of course, when we talk about alternatives, we're only talking about um, a percentage. No one's suggesting, I mean, I, I, as I said at the start, we see London in, in, in through three lenses, a domestic, a European, and a global uh, market. For sure, the domestic market will sustain, and the global market should be sustainable. It's the European element of that that's um, potentially under a lot of risk. May I just add a couple of points Please. to that? Uh, well, on the global uh, part of it, I mean, a substantial part of global business is actually related to our access. We, we are a beachhead to the European market, so at least some of that will suffer. And the second is, if you look at the tone of the Brexit campaign and the anti-bank, anti-establishment, anti-financial services, anti uh tone, um, it is unlikely that the new government will be able to prioritize financial services no matter what the economic logic might be. So I think that the um, given limited political space, the incentive to prioritize passporting, continuation of passporting arrangements would be rather lower than what might be economically and financially sensible. Thanks, Sunny. If I could stay with you for a minute for the final question that's just come in. Um, you, you've spoken to this issue already earlier, but the question is, with a, with a Brexit, uh, will we witness the creeping death of the EU single market, which is already under pressure? looking at the reinstalled borders in East European countries, et cetera, around the migration crisis. Do you have any thoughts on that? I think the biggest shame will be, if you look at modern OECD economies, uh, by far the largest percentage of the GDP actually comes from services, not from, not from goods anymore. And what we have in the EU at present is a still incomplete single market in goods, uh, for the most part, the single market in services hasn't really properly begun. And uh, the UK has been the biggest champion of opening up, liberalizing, and creating the single market in services. 
and for sure the that process will almost surely come to a dead halt so there'll be a huge opportunity cost but again depending on the kind of deal that the UK gets a gradual unwinding uh, menu based approach I like this element I like free movement I don't like uh, agricultural uh, cap policy etc countries or at least elements within countries politically increasingly strong elements might want and move towards a menu based option which I think could be the beginning of the end of the single market which is why the incentive for the rest of the EU to make sure that the UK is penalized that everybody can see clearly that it's all or nothing that you cannot have a menu based arrangement would be the politically most likely response and under that scenario I think the single market it will continue it will not exactly ever meet the potential it had if we had ever uh, managed to get a proper functioning single market in both goods and services but a single market in more or less its present form should be sustainable and will remain. Thank you Sonny. Uh, clearly these are complicated issues and the choice before the British electorate next week is a critical one. Um, my hope is that this discussion was able to add some clarity and substance to what has become a very emotional debate. I just want to conclude by thanking our guest speakers, Alan Holman and Sunny Kapoor for their insights, and to all of you for participating in today's webinar. You will also receive a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours with a link to a recording of today's webinar. If you have any questions or would like additional information about the content referenced here, please visit us at bfna.org or bertelsmann-stiftung.de. On behalf of the Bertelsmann Foundation, Bertelsmann Stiftung, and our presenters, thank you for joining us today and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.